Welcome everybody. Hello, my name is Ruth Cook. I'm the Managing Director of Action Learning Associates. Very pleased to welcome you to this webinar. We know that we have a few other people still to join us. Um, so we will start in a few moments. Um, we appreciate your patience, but um, while we're waiting a couple of minutes, could you answer this welcome poll? So we've got three questions and it would be very helpful if you can tell us something about yourself. What's your experience of action learning? Have you ever used action learning with a team? And what sector do you mostly work in? Thank you. Okay, so I can see that we've got an audience today that's uh, mostly got some experience of action learning, 68%, um, and um, some, and you've sometimes used action learning with teams. So that's also useful to contribute your experience today. And we've got a cross sector of um, sectors represented. So thank you for that. I'll leave the poll open for two more minutes. Okay, and whilst we're waiting for a few others to join us, um, can I introduce you to the team that's with us here today? Uh, we've got Sonia Antil, who's my co-director and who's presenting the webinar with me today will be contributing some elements and will also be helping answer questions. And uh, we have Julie Kenyon, who confusingly has a photo of me on her screen. So, so that's, uh, that's me rather than Julie um, and Klaus Lemmes. And they're both here to uh, give technical support. So if I can just um, say a few practical things. Um, if you've got any problems, technical problems or other problems that you want uh, a quick answer to, then the best thing to do is to talk to either Klaus or Julie via the chat screen. Um, and we'd love you to put your questions, not in the chat screen, but in the Q&A. So if in the bottom bar, you can see a Q&A, please feel free to add your questions there. So I'm going to end the poll now. Thank you. Um, and I know that one question that we often get asked is um, whether people can have the slides. And so, so just to say that we will email you with the slides after today. And the recording of today's webinar will be on the website in a few days time. So let me tell you what we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to talk about how you integrate action learning in the day job. So not a specialist CPD activity, uh, not a learning and development activity, but every, in everyday team working. We're going to talk about the applications of, of action learning, and I'll be describing a few different applications with teams and the core ingredients. And there's particular challenges that arise when you're using action learning with teams, and we'll talk a bit about those. So, and following on from the challenges is what's needed for success. We'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers and um, will also outline for you the future programs that are coming up. So let's get going with thinking about what any team needs 
in a normal world. I hesitate to say that because who knows what normal is going to be. But what does any neat team need from a facilitator or from their leader? And what does your team need right now in a COVID world? Um, we all know the enormity of the challenges uh, that some people have maybe joined a team and never met with their colleagues uh, physically. Some people have had, are just about starting their second period of furlough, uh, whereas others have been working away and perhaps balancing childcare and a full-time job and having a really hard time. So the dynamic between those two groups of people can be pretty tough. Um, there is the possibility that people working from home, working at a distance, have just been doing their own thing. And there can be differing responses to COVID-19 and differing degrees of anxiety and insecurity. So it's having a different impact on individuals and that um, is obviously having an impact on a team. So there can be a loss of focus at this particular time. So let's talk about how you might integrate action learning into the day-to-day -day work. And I'm going to talk about four possibilities. Building in reflection and review time. Working with projects or project teams. Matrix working and handover situations and critical incidents. Um, so let's um, start with what are the core ingredients what makes it action learning and not just a team discussion what are what's specific um, to an action learning approach i would say that it's one person talking um, so you listen in um, some depth to somebody talking one individual it might be a shared concern it might be a shared challenge but one individual explores that through talking and other people listening. And then you would have a time of open questions when um, individuals can, they may have a view about what's been expressed, but they're asked to just for the time being stick to open questions to explore and to probe. The person who began the presenter will then talk about their actions and it may be that there would also at that stage be team actions and a, and a time for both individual and team learning reflecting on what people are taking away from that session how their understanding has changed you might also have a peer consultancy as a way of working with a team so what i've described so far is the classic action learning approach but the peer consultancy um, approach includes time for idea generation. So let me um, go through the examples that I described. So first of all, um, reflection and review time. So um, it can be that action learning is used to create a regular slot in team meetings. I can think of a director that I knew at a mental health charity, and she was a member of an action learning set. Uh, she'd never trained as a facilitator, but she was skilled from having done it for many years. And she used action learning with her team as a regular activity. And she was able from that to really find out what was going on at a different sort of level than if she just talked individually to them, or if she just had kind of a report on, on their work. So. It, People valued that within the team um, and they trusted her to be the facilitator of that, even though she was their line manager. So it was an unusual arrangement. It might be a scheduled activity in away days. Um, so it would be a way of structuring some reflection time and, and opening up a topic um, in some depth. And it might be that it's um, an inquiring approach at key times in the cycle of a team's work. Um, the benefit for, them, for the team is that it promotes active listening and it, and it gives everybody a structure so that they can participate 
and and people can come out of maybe fixed opinions, adversarial approaches, um, and instead um, really explore and probe through questions and through really listening. Um, I was struck by an article I read at the weekend by Nancy Klein uh, based on her new book, um, The Promise That Changes Everything, I Won't Interrupt You. And it, it's got a lot of relevance for action learning because she talks about um, how everyone longs for the promise of no interruption, the promise of interest, the promise of attention while we think, think. and yet it is nowhere. We look at around and we see only interruption. Our colleagues interrupt, our beloved interrupts, our friends interrupt, we interrupt. So she quotes some research from the Gottman Institute in Seattle. And three years ago, the average listening time of even professional listeners was 20 seconds. And now their most recent research suggests that it is 11 seconds. And even for people who are trained as coaches, pastors, teachers, um, what she says is what we've learned is how to insert, how to tailgate, how to justify the populating of silence with our own view. So an interesting challenge from Nancy Klein, but it can certainly happen in team meetings that people are listening with a view to interrupting. They're preparing their response, their alternative view. And if they use action learning, there is a chance that they might listen differently and respond differently. So projects, let's start thinking about action learning as a project activity. It could be the activity for a project team. Um, it could be part of a regular project team meeting. So it doesn't replace all the other reporting and, and planning time together but it might be um, a space, a protected space within that project team meeting. Or it could be for um, project leads. So different projects, different project leads coming together to learn from each other's experience, to explore common organizational issues, but perhaps, um, and to, to gain from the fact that they are all project leads at the same time. So some examples from our experience, and Sonia's going to come in here and give you uh, some examples. Yeah. So I've just unmuted myself. You can hear me, Ruth? Yes, fine. Yeah, good, so I'm assuming everyone else can. Um, so a couple of really good examples here for projects and teams. Um, there was a printing company that we worked with, a very large global printing company, and they were, moving a whole lot of their technology from one platform to another. And I had in an action learning set, which met six times, the head of, they didn't call it inks, but it was effectively the head of inks, the head of hardware, the head of software, I had somebody from a regulatory team, somebody from QA, I had somebody from a mathematical modeling team. Um, and these people were leading work streams um, in their professional functions, you know, chemistry or inks or hardware, whatever that contributed to the project. It was a hugely complex project. And during the set, each person presented on um, whatever, whatever was their current challenge that day that they wanted to present on. And they'd take open questions and do the kind of action learning work that we, we know and love. And at the end, when they got their own actions, we also did what you might call a peer consultancy round, um, which could have included either offers or suggestions or requests from, the other people who were on this large project who realized the individual presentation had a kind of knock off in, you know, impact on their, on their um, workforce or their teams. So it's a huge team building uh, sort of side effect, if you like, of this, as well as the project, the large project itself becoming more integrated. So that was one example with everybody leading work streams on one project. And shall I go ahead and give a different example, Ruth? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. So the other example was um, a team of business development managers in a, uh, in a hardware company. Literally, they sold massive manufacturing machines. And they uh, each had a project that they were, that had national impact, although they were regional sales managers. And what that meant was, for instance, uh, when somebody in Scotland was working on his project, 
which would be to improve hardware sales, for instance. Um, or, or somebody in the South had a project which was to revisit the contracting arrangements of, and leasing. They then worked with people who were outside of their territory. And again, as we did for the printing project, after they'd gotten their actions, they then sometimes uh, did offers or helps, help, you know, helps or offers of help and requests and so on at the end of the set. So again, there was a huge team building impact, although people's individual responsible projects were their own individual responsibility. And what was interesting there is everyone was actually measured on those projects. So it was a company and everyone was targeted, literally, how, you know, how much more are you selling as a result of this action learning set? Um, and it, so that was a different, a different approach to individual projects in a team. So those were, those were them, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sonia. Um, I want to talk a bit about matrix, matrix working. Uh, we know that uh, it's a challenge to make matrix structures work well in practice. So it is possible um, to build in action learning to improve communication and understanding between all of those who are involved in the matrix structure. It could be that you used action learning for the, to, to bring the key players together. And again, you would have an in-depth exploration of, of the challenges. Um, it can also be um, at a handover stage, either a handover of project or a handover of role or responsibilities. We've been um, working, we are working on a very exciting project um, with international NGOs to bring action learning to the to the front line of humanitarian aid situations or development situations. So we've been working with Oxfam, Medicine Sans Frontier and others. And what they talk about is that the difficulty of, of handover, that very often when staff are moving quickly between projects, it's really um, difficult for to ensure that the proper knowledge is transmitted from one person to another. So you could, it's an interesting idea that I haven't yet used, but you could use action learning at that stage um, if there's a crossover of people at the point of handover. And it could be a way of bringing all the stakeholders together and again providing a structure for those stakeholders to listen to each other. Another example would be critical incident, uh, where you have critical incidents either in a health or social care background, and there needs to be some learning from mistakes. What is it that's gotten wrong? How can we ensure that um, it doesn't happen again? And using action learning at that point might be a way of helping organisations truly learn uh, from the critical incident and, and not respond defensively. What it would do is you hope it would create an atmosphere that isn't about blame, but is about understanding each other's perspective. So listening to each person's exploration of what happened from their perspective and other people responding to that account by asking questions. Could also be used for reviewing success. Um, there can be a way in which teams just to kind of celebrate a success, but don't think about what's the learning from that, how why was it a success? What can we learn from it? How can we replicate it for the future? Um, so Sonia's going to give an example um, of a critical incident uh, where action learning was was used. And that's that's particularly well timed, Ruth, because we've had a question come up. I think was it from Candy? Can you talk more about the critical incident review? Okay. Not convinced. Um, I get that. I totally get that. So this happened in a childcare, um, this particular example I'm going to give you, I've got permission to talk about, and it happened in a children's charity. Uh, and the last presentation of the, the training course, we were looking for, you know, presentation, and somebody suggested uh, a case that she'd been the social worker for, um, a children's case, that had gone, that was going to serious case review, and there was nothing she could do differently there and then, but she suggested it as a way of testing out this approach you know, will action learning work 
for something that's in this state, you know, serious case review, the mass the events have happened um, and what learning could be gotten from it. And we tried it out and she did, as, as you know, we would be doing, you know, she presented on this issue. She told the story effectively. Uh, and when the set understood the story, the story, the account, she got open questions. Now, the questions were, were around, let's really unpick the learning that you got from that experience. Um, you know, what, how, how did it, she got questions like, how did it feel? You know, what was the impact on you? Um, you know, if you were dealt, if you were faced with this particular situation in the future or this kind of situation, what would you do differently? Because there was no option to do differently in that particular family situation. Um, and one of the things that came out of this, and, and uh, we've been allowed, been allowed, given the license to talk about it, um, she, this particular social worker realized that in fact, she'd been very poorly supported um, by her organization. And yet the organization that was doing the serious case review, the external body was speaking very well of her work, <coughs> excuse me, you know, really praising her work. Um, and she went back and had a retrospective conversation with her manager. You know, um, you know, now I've looked into this and inquired into it, you know, all those days and weeks, I went home isolated and terrified and felt felt very, very exposed. And yet my professional practice by another body is being held up as something quite special. And as a result of this, and it's really quite a powerful story, the um, her manager really listened to her. And in fact, um, you know, after some conversations and what have you, um, put her forward. Oh, excuse me, I'm just gonna have some water. <coughs> excuse me, put her forward for the Social Worker of a Year Award. Um, she didn't get it, but she certainly got kind of really serious recognition in her organization as a result of doing that piece of work, as well as obtaining organizational learning from going through a serious case review. So, um, so that's where that's what happened there. So that's a sp one specific example. We've got others, but uh, we haven't got time to inquire into all of them now. So I'll hand back to you, Ruth. Thank you very much, Sonia. So what are the challenges of using action learning with a with a team? Obviously, firstly, team dynamics, especially I think for intact teams, i.e. kind of ongoing organizational teams. There can be history, of course. There can be um, existing relationships that may be problematic. Uh, there may be past conflicts. All of those will influence the team dynamics. There's issues around power in a team, both formal and informal, and that may impact on the dynamics of action learning. And I think there are particular challenges around confidential confidentiality, sorry, that it may not be possible, it may not be appropriate to have the usual ground rule about confidentiality. So the team would need to negotiate or contract with each other. Um, what's, the, what's the confidentiality ground rule that's gonna work for us here? We, how, how can we enable us to talk as freely and as openly as possible, but recognizing that some of what we talk about may need to be dealt with outside of this, this forum. So what's needed for success? I would say a well-functioning team. Um, people who have attended Action Learning Facilitator training with me will know that I say, this is a powerful tool and it's potentially dangerous. Uh, and if you, if you as an external person get invited into a team because it's not functioning, then action learning is not the solution. Um, it's not the first solution anyway. Uh, you need a reasonable degree of trust. There needs to be some openness and trust between the team members if action learning is going to work. And the boss, if the boss is going to participate in the action learning process, they need to be able to be a peer for the purpose of action learning, not suggesting that they don't, they can stop being the boss, of course they can't, but for the purposes of that process, they can act like a peer and they're not going to be putting in boss type interventions all the way through the action learning process uh, because I think that would detract from it. And there needs to be clear contracting. 
everyone understands what they're letting themselves into and everyone is willing to participate. So that's what's needed for success if you're going to work um, with action learning. I can see we've got some more questions coming in. So please uh, start the questions flowing in. And uh, Sonia will help me um, pick out a few from the list in a moment. But um, one that we're often asked is, what are the benefits of doing action learning in team? Um, I would say that um, it's, it's very much um, a team development tool. It can be a team development tool. So it helps you build a team. Uh, it helps develop trust and um, openness in a team. I quite often get invited into organisations and, and other people within Action Learning Associates. We often work with um, an existing team to train them all as action learning facilitators. And what, what happens is that they say, this has been a fantastic team development activity uh, that we've really learned about each other and about each other's work and about our approach. So it builds trust and honesty and it gives um, space for people to learn from each other. Um, so, Sonia, do you want to um, yeah. give us another question from the? OK, well, I think the early oops, excuse me, the earliest question that came in was from Miles and um, he's asking more about using action learning with matrix working and in those kinds of structures. So I don't know what your thoughts are there, Ruth. But I think um, the person who's working within a matrix structure and uh, maybe working to two or three different people who may not standardly get together can often be in a very difficult position with competing priorities and people not understanding the demands that are being made on them from different directions. And action learning might be a structure to bring people together in that situation and have them listen to each other and negotiate with each other. And perhaps the presenter would most obviously be the person who's the cornerstone of the matrix. It could also be a way that people who are in a matrix structure explore things with other people in the matrix, both about matrix working and what is functioning and what isn't, but also about um, general things that they may face in common. I hope that helps. Um, so I can see a question from yeah. Mel. Yeah, uh, Mel has got, when working with teams, how much time would you recommend spending introducing people with no action learning experience to the core ingredients and techniques and so on? So what be your thoughts there, Ruth? Yes, I think um, you probably need at least an hour, ideally a bit more, especially if you want to give people a chance to um, to have a go at open questions, for example, not in an action learning, but just in a, you know, a, a trios or pairs. If, if you think that that would be a skill that they would need to develop, you might want to build that in as well. But at least an hour to describe what action learning is, where the methodologies come from, what it looks like, and, and to allow them to um, negotiate with themselves about the contracting element. Is okay. there anything you'd add to that, Sonia? Um. I have known people, um, I don't know what we say, do it incredibly fast as a one-off. Uh, it's not what we'd recommend, but it's what popped into my head, seeing the question. So I've known people who are looking to get, get their kind of facilitator hours up to get accreditation, mm -hmm. go and do it in their team and just explain it to their team in like 10 minutes or 20 minutes and then say, you know, give it, give me your best shot here. Um, it's not, it, it would be much better to do it the way that you've just, Ruth's just described it, to explain it properly. But as a one-off, we're going to experiment with something once or twice. I've known that happen. Yeah. Um, so another question we've got here from Siobhan. Um, do you think it's crucial to call it action learning? Mm -hmm. Or can you just talk about the structure of questions and listening and so on? Yes, it's interesting. Um, Mike, Mike Pedler, who's the guru of action learning in the UK, I would say, um, Professor Mike Pedler has written lots of books on action learning. He says we get 
hung up on process and that what we should think about is an action learning approach which is a kind of an inquiring approach so so no i don't think you need to call it action learning i think i think you can just introduce um an inquiry approach to a team activity okay and um yeah, and I'd, I'd endorse that really, and I've known organisations give it different names or not even give it a names, name, call it, call it, let's have an inquiry into something. Yes. Um, so taking a different tack, but very much with teams, Dylan Tomlinson's asking, how suitable is action learning for conflict management? I have to be honest and say, I've never used it directly for conflict management with the parties themselves. I think people often bring situations of conflict that they wish to present on. That's quite often the topic that people um, present on, but actually within a team or within a situation. And I have, um, this was somebody who came on our facilitator training program and the, the, first, um, the first use of action learning that she'd had was a big conflict management situation. And she'd put people into action learning sets who were on different and was organized organization wide and she put them into action learning sets for them to get clearer about their perspective on the situation and then for them to listen to each other so it was really fascinating um, but I have to say I haven't done it and uh, you know if you're fairly new to action learning I, I wouldn't recommend it as the first thing that you do she it worked really well and she um, she kept she became an accredited action learning facilitator and she wrote about it in her her reflective learning log and can I can I add to that? Yes. I mean, I'd, I'd completely endorse what you've said here, Ruth. It's not the first thing to get, not the first tool to go for, to if you've got a team in conflict and you'd need to be experienced. But I, I had a set where two people had a conflict between them and they brought that into the room uh, and one of them elected to present on her side of it. Mm -hmm. um, she elected to, I mean, it was a safe, well, she chose, you know, for her, she chose, chose to do that. Um, and we had, you know, we particularly revisited contracting around the fact, you know, one person's side of the story, if you like, one person's point of view was being interrogated in depth and the others obviously wasn't even being heard. So we, we kind of had a kind of revisited our, what contracting looked like in that quite heightened situation. And it was incredibly successful. Um, and it's something in the air at the moment, I'm coughing too. Um, it was incredibly successful. The person who presented, uh, understood sort of more of what she brought to the situation uh, and felt incredibly heard incidentally by the person she had the difficulty with. Um, and for the person who had the difficulty with her and was just in the set, it was quite transformative to just listen, mm. put aside her own issues around, around the relationship, the friendship, whatever, the, it was a work relationship uh, and just listen. So it's not, I wouldn't recommend it, but I have known it to be really successful, I guess I'm saying. Uh, and your example, Sonia, thank you, reminded me of um, a team that I worked with, which included two people who were a job share. And yeah. they each worked, it wasn't straightforward conflict management, but it was the kind of tensions and things that arise in a job share. And uh, one of them presented on it with the other yeah. one in the room. And it was, it was fantastic. It was a really, as you say, a good way of really listening to each other. Mm. Um, um, I'm conscious that we missed a question um earlier on asking yeah. if we could um kira's asking if we could oh, share yes. some of these so obviously there are lots of books on action learning um we we don't uh publish our core ingredients principles and techniques because we think you really need to try it out in a program and so um, it's not on our website deliberately uh, and we'd encourage people to join an action learning facilitator program hear about those things the core ingredients the principle the technique try out some techniques but experience it rather than just reading about it so um i hope that's okay kira that's our answer to that uh, john's got a great to see you here john john's got a really good question which kind of gets to the heart of the matter really for the for this webinar who is best placed to facilitate when using action learning with a team mm. There is an advantage in it being external, um, somebody completely external to the team, an external facilitator or somebody external to the team who's got a different role within the organisation and has, who is used to action learning. There can be an advantage to that. I think there's a particular challenge about um, 
the boss being the facilitator. That's why that example I gave earlier is quite surprising that it worked so well, really, but it did. Uh, and I can only assume that that was because there was a high degree of trust between the boss and the team members, but it was the boss who was the facilitator. And I think um, a team member can volunteer um, this activity for a team can say, let's let's try and do something different. Let's um, let's try out action learning or call it something something else. Um, thank you for that prompt, Siobhan. It's true that sometimes the name does get in in the way. Okay. Um, and someone's here. Sue, Sue Connell's here asking about using it in a team away day. Um, she's saying that they tried it during a tender time and focused on the origins exercise and a light session of linking in and the team went from being stressed to having a lot of empathy for each other that's quite a lovely example I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that Ruth well people might be wondering what the origins exercise is and it's an activity that we quite often use with new action learning sets and uh, with also with when people come on an action learning facilitator training program so people talk about um, their origins and their influences and what's important to them and each person talks five minutes ten minutes and the rest of people listen and I've used that activity um, with teams on a number of occasions and people have said I've worked with you for for years and I never knew that about you or I suddenly understand why something is so important to you. Um, so it, that can be really useful. So I can see um, during a tender time, um, that would be a useful activity to do if you really want the team to kind of have some time away from thinking about tenders and contracting and really supporting each other. Hmm. Okay. Um, and it's interesting, I, I misheard that, I misread that as tender, not meaning tender purchasing, but tender difficult, but either time that would work for. Um, <laughs> We've got a question, a good question here from someone who's come up as anonymous. If you were incorporating it into regular team meetings, what would it look like? And follow up is, would the team choose one person to present an issue, for example, each time? So what might it look like in, if you're using it in regular team meetings, Ruth? Yes, I think exactly that, that you would have one person presenting an issue each time. Um, and the expectation is that that would rotate. If you were going to do it as a regular activity, you'd you'd hope and expect that everybody would be willing to do that at, at some point. Talk about some something. So protect a slot of time that um, is for exploring one person's the challenge, the biggest challenge that they're facing in their work at that moment, or something. And um, I think the difficulty when it's part of a regular team meeting is that if you've got 20, you know, who's, <laughs> which of us has been in team meetings where it hasn't just run out of steam at the end, you know, you get to the item six or not item 18 and, and everyone's really fed up and wanting, wanting to finish. And I think that's particularly true at the moment when people are having back to back meetings um, online. So I, I think there is a question about when you have it within a team meeting. And, and maybe you have it at the beginning or maybe you have it halfway through, but certainly I wouldn't sort of add it on as a tag on activity that we get to if we've got enough time. You sort of kind of structure it in properly. Okay. Anything you would add to that, Sonia? No, I'd, I'd agree that it's definitely not a thing to shoehorn at the end because then it, everyone's just too exhausted. But I think if it's structured properly, it can really help with the energy in the meeting. You know, it just changes the dynamic for a while. You do something in depth in a different way, uh, but it would need the time to be properly protected and, and resourced. Right? And I think that would probably be 45 minutes, I'd say. It'd be pretty tough to do it in half an hour, but allowing 45 minutes or an hour for one person to explore something. And, and Candy asks, what's the minimum length of time you can run a set session for. So in other words, not one individual's airtime, uh, but the whole session. Um, we always used to say three hours, three and a half hours is, is a good length of time for action learning. So in other words, kind of allocating half a day for it. Um, I think in the, in the current COVID world, when people are spending a lot of time on Zoom, the thought of a three hour meeting feels pretty daunting. 
um, actually quite often it isn't once they get into it and they realize this is a different way of relating to each other and this is actually nourishing rather than oh yeah another meeting but um so we've been certainly under pressure to reduce the amount of time that you can do action learning in and we have been um doing it in two hours in some cases so it's not ideal but it's possible okay and um, I'm conscious of time, but a couple of more, another, couple, another question we've got here we haven't got to is, um, I don't know how to say your name, but Sarada, Sarada, maybe. Can you say more about peer consultancy and the ways of capturing the ideas that are generated and who owns the collective or intellectual property? So mm -hmm. one sentence, but I think it's got two, at least two questions in there. <laughs> um. Well, I'd say that peer consultancy is when you move out of questioning mode and you first of all define what's the topic that this person wants help with. And then you move into, at its simplest, a conventional brainstorm where you would capture the ideas. And if you're working with a remote team and you'd capture them in the, in the chat function or on a whiteboard, but everybody's ideas would flow, uh, the creative the creative side of a brainstorm when you just let the ideas flow and then you might need to move into discussion mode and critical mode of, of brainstorming where people have an opportunity to discuss it and the person who's presented the challenge they may or they may not participate in that they may just listen to the team helping them come up with ideas or they they may want to contribute their ideas and who owns it well i'm guessing that if it's um a team then it would become the team's intellectual property but maybe you're thinking about something more specific there i'm not sure Sarada. um and and annabelle asks if um it could be an extended check-in and and yes that can be a form of um introducing an element of the action learning process into a, a team meeting and again in a world where we're all operating online, that is really useful to have an extended check-in and people to talk about what's going on for them. So I'm aware we're yes about end time. Um, thank you very much for those questions. And it's been great to see some old friends um, and some regulars here on the list of attendees today. Could you um, complete this closing poll, please? Um, and thanks for the endorsement, Siobhan, of our Action Learning Facilitator Training. I promise you we weren't paying her to say that it's excellent. Um, so did, did we have got three questions. Did today's webinar meet your expectations? There's an offer that if you're thinking about using Action Learning with a team and you'd like our help, then we could um, be in touch and, and talk to you about how we could help. And um, we've also got a, a half day coming up in virtual facilitation on the 18th of November. And um, you're welcome to uh, record your answer yes, and then we'll get back to you with more information about that. So just to tell you our uh, our future programs coming up. And I'm not sure I can do that until we close the poll, just one moment. Um, Yes, here we are. So we have um, this virtual facilitation training on a half day course on the 18th of November. And that's not action learning specific, that's general facilitation skills. So lots of um, team leaders, lots of facilitators, internal or external, are having to work virtually. And this is a way of improving your skills and helping you work with confidence. Um, we've got lots of demand for our action learning facilitator training at the moment, and um, we were getting to the point where we were booked up till March. So we've put on an extra program. So that's the 26th to the 28th of January, if you know anybody who'd like to sign up for that. And again, um, email us if you would like our help to um, work with you on something with a team. So just remains for me to say thank you very much. I'm really glad to see that uh, so far 88% of people have said that, uh, that that met your expectations. We're really um, keen to know whether these webinars are working and um, that's really helpful for us. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for 
participating everybody and I hope it's um, been useful to you. Look forward to seeing you at our next 